Welcome to today's Zeke webinar. Um, it's all about broker and we'll give it a few more minutes for people to join. Uh, so sit back and relax for just a few minutes and we'll get started shortly. Again, welcome to today's Zeek webinar. Today we have Dominic Charousset with CoreLight. He's on the open source team and he's active in the Zeek community. And today he's going to be presenting on Broker, which is Zeek's messaging library. And with that, Dominic, the floor is yours. Thank you for the kind introduction. I hope you guys can hear me. And if you would like to learn more about me, you can find me on my personal homepage, Dominic Charousset. And with that, let's start our webinar on Broker. If you have questions or if I'm not loud enough or unclear, then please type in the chat room. And I hope I can give you a general idea today of what Broker is good for and where to start if you are interested in using it for example, in your scripts, or even for custom Python or C++ applications. So before diving into Broker, we first need a quick look at Zeek clusters. And this is the idealized Zeek cluster that you may or may not know in some variation of this picture. And generally, you have the internet, you have your local network, then you have your tab and your front end, which distributes the TCP streams to your workers. And then you have your distributed Zeek instances. And the question is, how do they communicate? What do they need on infrastructure to communicate? And this, of course, depends. And foremost, it depends on the role the Zeek instance has. For example, the worker is your workhorse in the cluster. It sniffs the network traffic. It runs your protocol analysis. And depending on your scripts, this worker may have a lot of work to do. So ideally, the worker should not depend on too many data because it already copes with the network traffic. Then you have your manager. This Zeek instance generally creates a single global view so that you can have a single con log, for example. And also, if you need state at runtime, the manager is the single instance that knows what all workers are doing at any point in time. Then you have your proxy. Um, this is also an optional um, instance. The role of the proxy is to offload data storage, um, to run workloads that you don't want to run on the manager. And you could also spin up a logger if you want to offload even, work, uh, even more work from the manager. And the logger basically just does the log collection for the manager if you decide to run a logger in the first place. And looking at the Z cluster, there are a couple of challenges that we need to address when talking about a um, infrastructure. So for one, we have the data dependencies. Workers need to see different data than a logger, for example. Then the setup also must be flexible depending on the user needs. So we don't want to decide at development time uh, what instances there are because it, it doesn't make sense. Um, no size fits all. So we need to have a flexible deployment where users can 
spin up the components they need and spawn the walkers they need and orchestrate the system in a way that makes sense for their local environment. Then there's also state synchronization. Some workloads need global view. For example, if you're doing DDoS detection, then it's usually not enough to only look at a single walker because it may only see a fraction of the total connections that come in. And last but not least, users may want to integrate external data, for example, intelligence feeds. And we wanted to have a way to allow users to integrate with third party tools. So when designing a messaging layer for Zeek, um, as usual, if you ask five computer scientists, you get at least 10 opinions. But the model we are going with is that we have identified that we can fulfill our requirements basically with two building blocks. The first is topic-based publish subscribe, which just naturally models the data dependencies. And we also get our flexible deployment because of the publisher subscriber rendezvous. We don't need at development time to know who is talking to whom. All we need is publishers and subscribers and a system that figures out how to get data from the publisher to the subscriber. And the second thing we need is a distributed key value store because we need global lookup, we need global updates, and there are data structures in Zeek that you can synchronize across a cluster. And for this, we need to have some representation of state that is global to the cluster. And the simplest way to implement such a thing without like going with a full fledged database is just to have a key value store. And based on these considerations, the Zeek team has started Broker in mid 2013 with the first commits by John Civic. And from there, it grew over time. So now that we know um, why this thing exists, then we can talk about how to set up Broker and generally how the API looks. And just some broad overview over the project. Broker is an open source C++ library. There are Python bindings. Um, the project is fully BSD licensed. It's available on GitHub. You are going to need a somewhat recent version of CMake and OpenSSL, as well as CUF. CUF is a C++ framework for implementing distributed and concurrent systems. And this is what basically the engine that allows Broker to, um, to scale. And if you get Zeek with, from some package or even from GitHub, then you already have a bundled broker version in there. But you can also get a standalone version of the library. And if you want to interface with a Zeek, then you need to get the matching version for the network protocols to work. Okay, and let's get it. Let's get started with some terminology. So, worker is structured in terms of endpoints and data stores. And data stores come in two flavors. There is masters and clones. The endpoint is generally you can think of as a container for the publishers and the subscribers. And it gives context to the, to the um, software components that live in some form of process. Usually you have one endpoint per process. You technically, you can have multiple broker endpoints in a single process, but it's something you usually only do for testing, not for production environments. The master is the data store component that's basically the authoritative source. So 
the master, uh, all writes basically go through the master and more on that later. And clones, for now, you can just think of them as local caches that make lookups on your data stores faster. Okay, but first we take a closer look at the endpoints because this is the main entry point into the API. And endpoints are connected in broker terms via peering relations. And peerings basically are um, TCP network connections between, between your endpoints. And broker forwards any published data over these peering relations, uh, as long as there are there is a matching subscription on the other end. And to go a bit more in detail to peerings, we decided to not make assumptions on the environment and to leave decisions on the deployment to the Zeek user. For this reason, broker requires manual setup for the topology. So there are no magically discovered endpoints and there are no automatic connections because we wanted people to have full control over the connections in the network. And the basic API primitive for exposing a endpoint is just to open a TCP port via listen with address and port. And the address selects an interface where you are listening for incoming connections. So if you are passing 0000, you basically just accept connections from anywhere. And on the opposite side, you can connect to another endpoint with the peer function, and then you give a network address or host name, as well as the TCP port. One word of caution, broker assumes a loop-free topology. More on that later. For now, just keep in mind that with the current broker version, you want to build trees without loops. And we get into the details later. Okay. Then we start with a sim simple Zeek script to just show you how it's done if you are using broker at the scripting level. Um, we start with this redef just to tell Zeek to not shut down if there's nothing happening immediately because our Zeek init just calls listen with uh, the localhost address, which means only peers on the local on the local host are allowed to connect. And we are not passing a port here. This is because Zeek has a default, which you can also redef if you want to change it, and it defaults to 9999. And we also add an event handler that gets triggered by Zeek whenever a new peer connects. This is just called peer edit with the broker prefix. And you get an endpoint information, which is basically who is connecting to you and some message with um, information from the, from the network stack. And then there's also a peer lost event that you can capture. And for our little example here, we just wait for one peer to connect and we stop if the peer disconnects. This is the listener side. And on the connector side, we would also set this flag. And here we are going to use peer instead of listen to establish a connection. It does not matter in what order you start these scripts, because if you are calling peer, then Zeek is going to try to connect to this address in the background for some amount of time. Um, I believe the default is some, some couple minutes. So 
even if your connector starts first and it starts trying to peer immediately, it's okay if the if the other side shows up later. And here in our example, we just shut down if the, the connection was established. This is the Zeek scripting API. There's also a Python API. And of course, in Python, we don't have these events. So first, if you are writing a Python script, you need to import broker. And the broker binding for Python is for C Python. So it internally uses the C++ library. And it's basically a wrapper around the native API. And if you are using the Python API, we strongly recommend that you are using the with statements. And here you say, OK, I want to have a new endpoint. You bind it to the variable EP. And this allows Python to clean up this object once you are leaving this block. And to get the same status updates that we have seen previously, we also create a status subscriber. And by passing through, we see all events. Usually, a status subscriber only sees critical events. By passing through, you see everything. And then we can also call the listen function with 9999 and get the current status update. And this is the blocking function call. So here, you open up the socket. And then you wait until something happens. And then you could print it or look at the status code. And here you can see what Zeek basically converts to events, because these status updates that you get from the Python API has codes. And one code is broker.sc. SC stands for status code. And one of the status codes that you can get is peer edit. And in the Zeek script, we have seen that Zeek automatically converts these events to Zeek events. In Python, you can just um, look into the status and do whatever you want with it. And the connector is basically the same thing, just calling peer instead of listen. I also want to show you the C++ side of things. I promise this is the only C++ example today. And I try to keep it brief. But here you can see how Broker works internally. And even if you are staying at the Zeek scripting level, it's useful to know how things work underneath. So in C++, we are, of course, writing an actual application. So there's our main function that takes the command line arguments. Uh, we don't want to repeat ourselves over and over again. So we just import the broker namespace. And then here's the configuration object. The configuration object allows you to fine tune a lot of things in broker. For example, how many background threads broker uses, how and if metrics are exported. And most of the things you can set up on the configuration are also available on the Zeek side via scripting API or environment variables. But if you're working in C++ land, then you just have the configuration object. Uh, it can parse the command line arguments, which allows you to set all of the tuning parameters on the command line. And then you can create your endpoint and your status subscriber, the same as we did in Python. We call listen here again, and listen returns the actual port that has been used. And if listen returns zero, this means for some reason or another, this operation failed. So 
here you can just um, look if the listening actually did what you wanted. And if you replace listen here with peer, you, you get the connector from this example. And then we can, just like on the previous slide, get our um, status update. We have the status subscriber from get function. And this returns a status or an error. And in C++, this is a variant. So it's a type that can be either a status or an error. And you have to ask it um, which was in there. If it's a status, then it's something like peer edit. If it's an error, then it's something like peer lost. So it's something that actually um, usually is something you want to take action on. These status updates are just notifications that you could use to advance your state. For example, if you want to do something whenever a peer connects, or you could just log it. Okay, now that we know what an endpoint is, then we can talk about topics and subscriptions in Broker, which is basically the first of the two pillars that enable Zeek to do its distributed communication. Topics in Broker are just strings and ASCII strings, so no smiley faces, sorry. And subscriptions match topics based on prefixes. So it's just a prefix. And for example, you could subscribe to foo slash, and this would match foo slash bar, but not bar slash foo and not foo bar. If you would subscribe to just foo without a slash, then you would match foo slash bar and foo bar without the slash. By convention, Zeek and Broker use slash delimited hierarchies on names. So foo slash bar slash whatever. And if you are using Zeek, uh, if you are using Broker in your scripts or in your third party tools, then you can use the same convention or you can follow your own convention. Just keep in mind the matching really is just a prefix. So there's no logic uh, baked into broker that does something with the slashes. It's just a convenience. Okay, on the scripting side, we look at two scripts. In both scripts, we are using, again, this exit only after terminate flag to tell Zeek to keep running, even if Zeek in it doesn't do much. And then we declare some event my event, which takes a string and a count. And on our subscriber, all we do is subscribe to Zeek slash event slash. And then we start listening for incoming peerings. And we also provide a handler for our my event type. And on the publisher side, we do the peering. And then once we connect to another peer, then we publish something. And we publish to Zeek slash event slash my event. And we call the my event handler with the arguments high and zero. And we can also add a my event handler on this side, because if we publish something, then this event gets triggered on both sides. So it gets triggered on the remote subscriber and locally on the publisher. And this is the low level API that you can use. This is what's also available on Python and C++. And in Zeek scripts, there's also a bit of more magic that you can use. So here we have the same setup. We have the same subscriber. But this time, instead of using publish, we just do broker auto publish. 
And with this, we tell Broker or Zeek rather to publish for us whenever this event gets triggered. So here, instead of calling Broker publish on the peer edit event, we just trigger my event. And this implicitly calls Broker publish now because of the auto publish we did in Zeek init. And with this, you can basically have your events triggered across the cluster whenever this event gets called for whatever reason. Okay, then quick summary on the publish subscribe API. Zeek maps broker messages to events, as we have seen. With the auto publish, you also can get most of the boilerplate out of the way. You just set it up once and your events automatically get distributed. General advice, if you subscribe to something, subscribe before you call peer or listen, because new subscriptions need time to propagate. This is a distributed system. So the, the new subscriptions, they get forwarded eventually. But of course, if you first peer and then subscribe, then there may be some delay where you don't see the new, uh, where you don't need, don't see publications on the topic. And also an important point, published data cannot be recaptured later. There's no buffering in broker. It's just real time traffic that you can see. If you need some kind of, um, mechanism for data, then put it into a data store. And on the Python and C++ side, there are publish and subscribe functions. And these are blocking and asynchronous. So in the C++ API, for example, you could subscribe to a topic and then pass some callbacks that get invoked in the background whenever new data arrives, or you can get a subscriber, much like we have seen with the status subscriber, where you can ask for new data in a blocking way. Okay, that's to publish subscribe. The second thing we are going to look at are the data stores. And data stores are located on the endpoints, and both masters and clones attach to endpoints. This means the peering relations, so the connections you set up, basically do double duty. For one, they forward publish subscribe traffic and subscriptions, but they also forward the data store commands. And what is a command? Well, just think of this little setup here. We have three endpoints. We have one master and two clones. And if we modify our data, for example, we just say put with a key and a value, which is the most basic function on the data store API. If you call this function on the master, then it would update its state and forward the commands to the clones. They apply the change as well so that they have the new version of the key value pair. And if you modify your data on a clone, then the, the command goes to the centralized master. The master applies the change and then propagates the change back to the clones. With put, it's simple, but there are also other operations that atomically change values. And by going through the master, we make sure to always have a consistent key value store. And data stores in Zeek scripts uh, use opaque types. So the simplest type, uh, the simplest 
setup is that you declare a global variable, you declare it as opaque type of broker store, and then you can, in your Zeek init, tell broker to attach a master to this endpoint via create master with a name. And this name has to be unique. So if you are trying to create a master for the same name in a cluster, then you get an error. And the correspondent function for clones is just called create clone. And if you create a clone, then the clone tries to locate the master and gets the initial state from the from the store to synchronize with the with the upstream state. And for writing values, the easiest or straightforward function is just put, which takes any key, any value. Here we just have a key called one. We give it the, word, the value 110. And there are also increment and decrement functions. And they do atomic updates. So if two clones simultaneously call increment, then if you would read the value incremented and then call put, then you have a data race on the value. But by using increment, you don't lose information. You all you tell the master, please increment this value. And the master performs this atomically for you. And this way, you don't lose increment or decrement operations. You can, of course, also use sets. Here, we can have a set with A, B, and C. Then we can put this to the data store. And there are also atomic operations for sets, like insert and remove. And here is the same reasoning. If you insert into a set, you don't want to read it and write it back, because then you could override, override a new version by accident. And, and reading values is just broker get, and you pass the key and you retrieve the value. And data stores, as we have seen, have atomic operations like increment and decrement. They have the same for sets, etc. And key value stores, uh, key value pairs, also allow you to set an expiration time. For example, if your scripts create some um, table that should only be valid for some amount of time, you would store it with an expiration time. And then after some time, broker automatically drops the obsolete data. Zeek also has some magic for data stores that allows you to synchronize the table across the cluster without you ever using put and get. And all you need to do is to declare some table with the backend broker memory. And there's also a SQLite backend for persistent state. And if you're using this backend, then your state remains even when restarting the cluster, which is useful if you are storing like currently bad actors in the internet or what have you. Okay, that concludes our basic, uh, not basic, this concludes our first look at the API. And of course, Broker is still in development. So we are aware that the current approach has limitations and we discussed them here briefly and then I will update you on what's currently happening in Broker. Okay. The first biggie is that Broker assumes loop-free topologies. That makes the forwarding logic very simple. It requires little stake, uh, state, but the problem is that this is very easy to misconfigure and you cannot add fallback routes because on a tree, there is no fallback because if you add a fallback, then you have a loop and no longer a tree. And this rigid 
peering connection also hinders more use cases that we are interested in. So to give you a quick overview, how the clusters are setting up broker today. For example, if you use Zeek control to configure a Zeek cluster locally with Logger manager and two workers, then your final deployment looks like this. You have your endpoints in blue, the logger, the manager, two workers, and then internally they use the broker endpoint, the public API that we have seen. And for Zeek, this is the C++ API. And then broker has some way to communicate. This is usually just stream transport. So TCP at the end of the day. The subscriptions are stored per path. Users must avoid loops or otherwise break them. Zeek actually configures broker to turn off automatic forwarding and then just makes a full mesh. This is basically a way to make sure that if some, if one component fails, that the others can still communicate. But it, at the end of the day, it's very hacky. And there is a TTL, time to live, for events. Um, but even with small topologies, if you have a time to live for 20, this means each message basically takes 20 rounds and you flood the network very quickly. On the upside, there's a uniform flow of data right now. Um, internally, this is called node message. And everything is just based on simple TCP stream sockets. The endpoints only see their direct neighbors, so the peering that you have set up via listen and peer. And on each state, you have subscriptions, the forwarding flag, and this. The nice thing about this design is that it's very uh, local. So you have little state per node, simple dispatching logic. But of course, the downside is you can shoot yourself in the foot very easily. And there is no way to add redundancies. And if you would, uh, if you would like to use the public subscribe for some communication of data that should survive one or two link failures, you're basically out of luck. And the broker endpoints also don't know the topology. It's completely opaque. All they can see is the direct connections they have, and that's it. So because of these limitations, we have started implementing a new version of broker that increases robustness and also enables more use cases. And ALM is um, application layer multicast. And we want to overcome the current limitations that Broker has by combining ALM to express publish subscribe on a higher level than just TCP communication. And in order to have safe communications on loopy topologies, we are implementing source routing, which means that the sender decides who gets the data. And for this, of course, we need to have vision of the full topology. So the next generation of broker um, looks somewhat like this. There is still your Zeek uh, instances and you still have the same network connections underneath, but now there's a bit more logic to it. We have subscriptions per endpoint, and we break the loops via source routing, which means we need to have some routing table on each node, and the messages need to contain routing information, which means there's no longer this uniform flow of events where we just route along subscriptions, but we need to have more state. And all of this is, of course, peer-to-peer -peer technology. 
that gives us full visibility of the cluster topology with one exceptions, gateways, that I will have on the next slide. And with this new design, we have more state on the endpoints instead of having them just on the paths, which means we now know the full topology on each node. And the most important thing is forwarding just works. So we don't need to worry about how to set up the peering relations. You just connect all of your broker endpoints and broker figures out how to ship the data. And in the new design, the more loops you add, the more resilience you actually add to the system. Because if one link fails, you still have backups and you can send the next package through some other path. And this also enables new use cases, in particular with the Zeek agents. And I, I go into this on the next slide a bit. Um, the downside is we have more state per node because we need to have the routing table. And we also have more traffic because we need to subscribe uh, to flood subscriptions so that they can reach all the nodes in the network and to learn all the nodes in the network. And of course, there's also routing headers, which just add more data to each package. And on this, we are currently looking into how how big the impact on performance actually is. So right now, if you go to the broker repository, there is an open pull request for the ALM backend to broker. And we are going to basically stress test the new backend in the next couple of weeks. And if you're interested in this, by all means, um, say hi, and maybe you can try it yourself the new backend. And just to give you one more motivation for the new um, broker backend, if we are adding Zeek agents to the mix, then we, of course, don't want to have the, the full routing information on each agent because these things are supposed to be lightweight. They are supposed to have little state because all they do is collect endpoint, endpoint data and push them into Zeek. And for this, we have implemented gateways. And the gateway itself is a full member of the cluster. So it has all the routing information, it has all the subscriptions. And on the other side of the gateway are the agents and they are isolated. So all they see is the gateway and they just push data to the gateway and usually they don't receive any data. So the gateway connects two domains, agents only see the gateway and the gateway also sheets, uh, shields the overlay from frequent churn because agents, um, if you deploy agents on say laptops, then they just appear and disappear. And that's not what you want to have in a cluster because then you have very frequent updates on the routing tables and just add more communication overhead in general. Okay, that's all I have for today. Thank you for joining. And if you are interested in starting some project with Broker, then I recommend you to go to the docs, docsseek.org. And there you can find under slash projects broker, the documentation for broker. And I also recommend you reading the cluster setup documentation. And on the Zeek side, there's also a broker framework that you can use if you are using the scripting API. And this framework has a lot of convenience features. We have seen the auto publish feature and the automatic synchronization of tables. And there's a lot of stuff like this that make your life a lot easier. Um, 
but you yeah you just have to learn that these things exist and then you can start using them and if you want get involved get the sources or file feature and bug reports on github on zeek slash broker and you can also come to the open source um, slack channel and ask questions there or on the mailing list okay thank you for listening dominic thank you so much for presenting today um does anyone have any questions before we uh end today's webinar I'm not seeing any questions in chat. So with that, thank you again, everyone who attended. Thank you, Dominic, for presenting. And we will be posting the replay link and the slides uh, hopefully later today. So thank you all so much and have a great day. Thank you for organizing it. Goodbye. Bye.